let's see. I, I, th I think I'm on because I can hear myself uh, speaking. So, uh, hello, my name is Rod Ueda. Um, I am the chief of police of the city of Manhattan Beach. Now, I, I'm actually a real police chief. For most of you that don't know me, I think that I'm probably least like the person that you would picture a police chief to look like. Because uh, whenever I go to the Cal Chiefs Conference, LA City County Chiefs, if you were to pick the one guy in the room that's probably not the police chief, I'm the guy that they wind up picking. Um, but the funny thing is, is that I can walk into any hospital, uh, walk around like I know the place, and nobody messes with me. They just assume that I'm a technician or a doctor. <laughs> but, uh, but walk into a police station, it's halt! What are you doing in here? I just wonder when they're going to stop asking me at my own department when I walk in there, <laughs> things like that. Anyway, um, I am that little engine that could for that reason. Um, I can still remember my mother reading me that wonderful story back in um, some 50-odd years ago, and it really taught me that you, know, you can achieve anything if you really have the desire to do it and believe in yourself. Uh, I know that my mother back then, who's actually staying with me this particular weekend, I wish I could have brought her out here, but she's rather elderly, um, that she probably never knew that by telling me that story, she would set off a chain of reactions that would lead me to bring me to the highest rank in my profession, that of chief of police of this absolutely wonderful town of the city of Manhattan Beach. Uh, a lot of you may be thinking to yourself that, wait a minute, what's the big deal? I mean, any cop can go on to become the chief of police of any given city. And I would say that that's probably true. But if you look back 50 years ago, when I was growing up, um, and all the hurdles that were thrown in front of me, I think that, in a lot of ways, that um, it's very unlikely that I would have gone on to become a chief of police. And for you to know that, I have to tell you a little bit about myself. I happen to be of Japanese-American descent. And again, maybe not a big deal today, but 50 years ago, just a mere 20 years outside of World War II, that was kind of a big deal. Both my parents immigrated to, actually were here, but their parents immigrated to America from Japan. And back in uh, 1941, December 7th, we were brought into uh, the war. Uh, as a result of that, my parents were teenagers at the time, and they were moved into relocation centers uh, just because they looked like the enemy at the time. My mother uh, was moved into Wyoming, and my dad was moved over to Arkansas. Uh, they stayed uh, two months or two years in these camps. Um, and I dare say at that time, the Japanese Americans were probably the most hated race in this country. And I say that because nothing ever happened to Americans of German descent or of Italian des descent. It just happened to the Japanese Americans on the West Coast. So when you think about it, if my parents were even to think that their son, their little boy, who wasn't even born yet, would go on to become the chief of police in this country, that would be quite a hurdle to, to think that they could even imagine that at some point. While the war ended, my parents left camp and they met in Chicago and got married. They later moved to the West Coast and they had five children. And unbeknownst to me at that point, another hurdle would be thrown at me. And that is that I happened to be the third boy following the only girl that my family had. Which really meant that uh, there are no baby pictures of me. <laughs> I got a lot of hand-me-downs, um, and the bottom line is, is that any time spent with me meant time away from my sister, the princess of our family. <laughs> and that was okay. I, you know, I, I, was, I grew up a happy kid, uh, and I didn't really realize that until I had my own son. And then people started asking me, does your son look like you? And so I'd go looking for pictures of myself as a baby, and there aren't any. Uh, <laughs> to go back one. Well, because of the war, my parents were both teenagers during the war. Uh, they wound up not going to college. They wound up having much of an education. Uh, my mother didn't work to raise five children. Uh, my dad was a truck driver. And we grew up fairly poor in uh, East Los Angeles, actually in the middle of the barrio, where gang violence was rather high, uh, but education was rather low. Um, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to UCLA in computer mathematics. But even then, when my first year at UCLA, I couldn't even get into English 101 because my English was so terrible in terms of my writing written product, a product of the LA Unified School District back then, 
which I understand hasn't improved much over the last 50 years, uh, unlike the city of Manhattan Beach that has one of the finest school districts in the entire state. Um, so it was my dream to become a cop, but unfortunately, I was too short. A lot of people don't realize that, but back in the uh, 70s, to be a police officer, you had to be at least five foot eight, and I was only five foot six. I couldn't, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't change genetics. Um, and so I thought my dream was over. So I went to UCLA, and then in the second year, uh, the Supreme Court did away with height requirements. And I was able to get hired by the Pasadena Police Department as a cadet, and I thought all my dreams were going to come true. I became a police officer, but not so fast. That's when I really, truly felt like an outsider for the first time in my life. Um, when I started there, uh, all my brother and sister police officers were saying I was too short, I was too quiet. Uh, I was even asked things like, uh, how come you don't have an accent? Um, <laughs> and could I actually see out of those eyes of mine? <laughs> uh, one day I even came to a, a briefing. Every December 7th, they would wind up reading the weather report for Pearl Harbor, just so that I knew what it was like in Hawaii at that time. And one day I came to work and my entire desk was covered with barbed wire and the Japanese flag was draped over it. And I know that this was all done in jest, uh, but it was really clear to me that everyone felt that this little Asian guy would never amount much to law enforcement. And I was told this time and time again, I just didn't fit what police officers look like. And although I laughed it off and I had a pretty thick skin, you know, it did wind up hurting on the inside. Uh, but I always thought that if I just worked hard, get my nose to the grindstone, good things would happen to me. So, how did I succeed despite all these setbacks that I wound up having growing up? I never really gave it much thought, but when I look back, I believe that it was my parents that really did a good job in raising me. I believe that these lessons I learned from home helped to forge uh, the acknowledged leader that I am today, and it's my hope that these lessons might even help you or somebody that you know who strives to become one of our future leaders. So the first lesson was never give up. My dad never allowed me to give up on anything. In fact, I was brought up to never being able to say, I can't do something. And I tell that to my son and my daughter every single day that they tell me that they can't do something. Um, there's nothing that you cannot achieve if you try hard enough. Very few mistakes in life are what I call fatal. You learn from your mistakes and you don't repeat them. Make people forget and see a stellar performer in front of them. Whether you want that new assignment or promotion, keep studying, Keep working hard and testing, and make that decision maker look you in the eye and tell you that you're not going to get that promotion this time. Keep coming back. Don't give anyone the satisfaction of seeing you give up. Be proud of your heritage and your culture. This was a hard one growing up when everything that I watched on television growing up was of the American soldiers beating up on the Japanese guys. In fact, I would sit in front of the TV myself saying, hey, kill those dirty Japs, you know, look at the dirty American soldiers. And my dad would laugh and say, hey, what do you think you are? <laughs> uh, but my community, my community in East Los Angeles was mainly Hispanic, and I was often the brunt of a lot of Asian taunts and jokes. But my parents really did do a good job in pointing out all the good that was in my culture. Uh, the one thing that comes to mind real fast is the 442nd Combat Regimental Team in World War II, made up of all Japanese American soldiers that fought in Europe. They're still the highest decorated uh, armed forces unit in armed forces history, um, fighting in, in Europe. Um, I brought up learning martial arts, which taught me an incredible amount of discipline and inner peace. The samurai and the kota bushido, which is the way of the warrior, it taught me things like honor and loyalty and what they really mean. And my parents often talked to me about growing up in uh, the relocation centers, and I really understood the sacrifices that they made back then because they felt that by giving in to these, the relocation and to be good Americans, it was for their children. It wasn't for them, but they needed to lay a foundation for the future. And understanding that really helped me to understand why that happened. But the bottom line is, is that it made me very proud to look at that Asian face looking back at me in the mirror every single day. Um, never backing down from a fight. Uh, I guess that's some more of that samurai stuff in a lot of ways, but it taught me to be brave in the face of adversity, especially since being a little guy, I got my butt kicked a lot by a lot of guys bigger than me, and my dad would never allow me to lose a fight, so I'd actually have to go back there and pick a fight with the bigger guy that beat me up. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's 
kind of dad that I had. Uh, but the bottom line is that I did gain a lot of respect. Uh, for those of you that remember Cool Hand Luke, Paul Newman's character in Cool Hand Luke, or Rocky from, uh, Sylvester Stallone from Rocky, I mean, those guys got a lot of respect because they never gave up. They kept up the fight. Um, and you know, my son even asked me recently when we talked about fighting losing battles. He said, why would you fight a losing battle? And I told him that it's not because, it's not important whether you win or lose, and we've all heard that time and time again. But I said, it is important to fight for what is right. Um, and then he asked me, well, how do you know what's right? Because I don't want him to get in fights all the time at school and have me go down there all the time, especially the chief of police's boy. <laughs> Uh, but then I told him, just ask yourself a simple question, whether you know if something's right or not. And ask yourself, do you think that your parents, your family, and those that you love will be proud of you at the end of the day for getting involved in this fight, like protecting your sister? And if the answer is yes, then it's worth fighting for. And he's only nine years old, but he actually really understood that. He also happens to be a hockey player, so he likes to fight anyway. <laughs> he plays on the Junior Kings next door. Figuring things out for yourself. My dad would never tell me how to do a thing. Uh, he would tell me to look at it and figure it out. Although it was frustrating, it did give me this hunger for knowledge uh, that has never been quenched to this day. Uh, if I want to know something, I study, I read about it, I learn about it, and if it's important up, enough to me, I'll become an expert at it. In law enforcement, becoming an expert in search and seizure really helped me to elevate my career. I wouldn't trust other people because time and time again I would find out that these other people that you asked, they wouldn't want to tell you that I don't know, and so they would make something up, or they would give you bad information. Um, and I just didn't want to be a victim of that myself. Uh, it's funny, when I was putting all this together, it made me think to myself that figuring it out for yourself also is why my wife gets mad at me a lot, because uh, it's one of those things that I don't ask for directions either. <laughs> In fact, my son asked me uh, when I was lost one day, why don't you just ask somebody? I said, son, men don't ask for directions. <laughs> you just figure it out for yourself, which is why we love GPS, because we can yeah. secretly ask for directions instead, and that just takes us right where we're going, so we'll never have to ask anybody for directions again. Be a leader, not a follower. I still remember the heartache that I felt in elementary school, that those of us that grew up in the 60s, that when Batman t-shirts came out for the first time, I wanted one of those things so bad. Went to Sears and Roebuck and said, you know, Mom, give me a Batman t-shirt. And they, I think they're like five bucks. No, you're not going to get one. I mean, I was heartbroken over this t-shirt. I said, why can't I get a t-shirt? And that's where you hear that old adage over and over and over again. You know, if your friends jump off a cliff, are you going to go follow them? You know, I just wanted a t-shirt. I wasn't going to sign up for a suicide pact or something like that. Um, but I do tell my children the same things. Uh, and it really did take root with me. Uh, and when I was doing this just recently, it, it brought up another concept that by being a leader, not a follower, you don't succumb to something called groupthink. Uh, groupthink uh, led to a lot of disasters in our time. Uh, the Challenger disaster, the attack of Pearl Harbor was all a result of groupthink. Um, Often, too often, some folks go along with the decision of a group that they intuitively know is wrong. But they'll go along with the crowd anyway, especially when your friends are involved. And it does lead to a lot of catastrophic results. And this particular topic is really near and dear to my heart, especially today. Uh, when you have young people get in trouble, and you see that group think effect take, and I've talked about it in my organization time and time again, not to succumb to group think. You need to be a leader, not a follower. And this is something I really didn't learn at home. True leaders aren't afraid to hold others accountable. It took me about 18 years in law enforcement to learn this because I was, I did succumb to things like groupthink. You want to be part of the guys. You want to be friends with everybody. And it wasn't until I really understood that I'm not helping people by uh, ignoring misconduct, by allowing mediocre performance to, to seem good. You really help people by holding them accountable. You don't run from confrontation, because in the long run, you're actually hurting people. You're crippling them if they think that they can go through life with mediocre behavior time and time again, and you just pass them on through. Um, I don't try to alter my path when these people just try to distract you. Well, what about that person? What about that person? You really stay focused to try to really help them. Tell people the truth, and you'll help them grow and learn. Never settle for mediocrity. Set the bar high and hold them accountable to that bar. 
That is the absolute best way that you can help anybody. Carpe diem. Um, I'm going to end my talk with this because it's very apropos to why I'm here today. Um, carpe diem is Latin for seize the day. You know, having spent nearly 30 years with the city of Pasadena, I was very comfortable there. I was a captain with Pasadena. I was going to lay out my career there. And more importantly is I had a civil service protected position there. When the job open came here to become the chief of police, I became an at-will position. And that's very scary when you have two young children at home. Uh, and I really debated long and hard whether I was going to apply for this job or not. And then I saw the Dead Poets Society with Robin Williams. And it was that movie where they talk about carpe diem and seize the day. Go out and lead ex an extraordinary life. And it was the next day that I went ahead and applied for this job. And I've never looked back as a result of that. So in closing, I'll ask each of you to go out there and continue to leave extraordinary lives yourself. Your presence here today tells me that you're taking another step to invest in your future. Thank you for allowing me to share a bit of my life and my successes. I hope it was all worth your while, and I wish you the very best. Thank you.